Hi everybody, welcome to my homestead and welcome to my channel. My name is Jared. Yesterday I put out a video called John Taylor's Vision of the Future of America. And it's a really bleak vision. He sees Salt Lake City. There's like a disease that's going around. People are dying. He goes to Missouri and Illinois, Washington, D.C., New York City, Philadelphia, and just everyone everywhere is dying. It's, a, it's an apocalyptic, uh, grim vision of the future. Uh, and some people have supposed that it's essentially a vision of what's going to happen to the United States specifically before the second coming, right? The cleansing of America. Well, it turns out that it's false. I, uh, I put out this video and I have a subscriber, which I'm actually part of her Facebook group. It's like a, a private like study group. Uh, she doesn't want me to, to share the name of the study group. She, she wants it to be private, but her name is Jessica ship. I talked to her today. She had sent me like a plethora of, um, primary sources that say that this this was a false vision. It's not true, uh, according to Joseph F. Smith and others. So I'm correcting this. I, I'm going to correct it. Uh, I put it on my spreadsheet for uh, visions, visions and visitations. Let's see. Where is it? I have it right here. December 16th, 1877. So this is a pretty famous vision. I think most people in the LDS Second Coming community are familiar with this. Um, you can find it, like you can go uh, to the Church History Catalog, and they have Wilford Woodruff's journal, uh, and this is where it's recorded. So you would just assume, oh, okay, well, it's in his journal, so, you know, it's a valid vision. But it turns out that it's not. Um, one thing that always confused me from the very beginning is whose vision it was. Uh, you would just assume, oh, well, this is Wilford Woodruff's vision. It's in his journal. Other people have been like, no, it's uh, actually John Taylor's because it talks about how he's reading the book of Revelation in French. And, uh, you know, John Taylor was, uh, he spoke French and he helped with the translation of the Book of Mormon into French. Um, but it was never really clear. It, it always kind of just bothered me. I, I went along with how other people interpreted it, that it would have been John Taylor. But it was pointed out, as we're about to see, that there's like this blank spot right here, right? So it says, a vision. Uh, Salt Lake City, night of December 16th, 1877. I, and then a blank was left right here. And so the idea goes that uh, Wilford Woodruff, he, uh, he was working for the, her the church history department, or I don't know what it was called. We're, we're about to read it in one of these, one of these sources I'm about to share with you, but he was in that office and he came across this vision. He's like, oh, okay, I'm going to, I'll record it, but I don't know who it's from. And so that's why there's the blank. Okay. So anyway, you can see how someone may mistakenly think, oh, this is a valid vision. I mean, look, I'm looking at the church website, the church history catalog. This is his journal. So and, and I don't think anyone could fault you for that. But thankfully, we have additional insight into this one. And I don't think that this means that we should di just discount other things. You know, I'm still going to keep this spreadsheet that has all these different vis visions and visitations. Although, <clears throat> with uh, most of these other visions and visitations, they come from authoritative, like it's clear uh, who's having the vision or the visitation. <clears throat> sometimes it's shared in general conference. Sometimes it's in uh, the dedication or the dedicatory prayer of a temple. So a lot of these are much better sourced than this one uh, that's supposed to be John Taylor. Okay, so she pointed me to um, a book by Richard E. Turley Jr. And just so you know who he is, Richard E. Turley Jr. Uh, was named as the new managing director of the public Public Affairs Department of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Latter -day Saints on April 26, 2016. Prior to his appointment, he served for eight years as assistant church historian and recorder. He also served for eight years as managing director of the Family and Church History Department, over overseeing the church archives and record center, the church history library, and the Museum of Church History and Art, which collectively contain the world's largest collection of resources for the study of Latter-day Saint history, and one of the richest collections on the settlement of the Western United States. So that just gives you an idea who he is. Um, he wrote this book, <coughs> excuse me, called Victims, the LDS Church and the Mark Hoffman case. 
and I'm I'm not too familiar with this. I think it has to do with forgeries, and um, there was a con man, you know, that had pulled one over temporarily on the church. It seemed legitimate, but it turned out to be a forgery. So that's what the book is about, but it talks about this vision that we're talking about in this video. All right, so let's read this part that has to do with the vision that we're talking about. Okay. On June 15th, 1878, Assistant Church Historian Wilford Woodruff, who later became the church's fourth president, spent most of the day in the church historian's office. Later, he recorded in his journal that while he was in the office, he had, quote-unquote, a very strange vision copied. In the same journal entry, and, and you can see that right here, just like right above it, it, it talks, you can see it right here, I had a very strange vision copied uh, into the... It's hard to read, but... Okay. In the same journal entry, Woodruff, dis, Woodruff transcribed a copy of the peculiar vision. It described a desolating sickness of afflicting communities from Salt Lake City to the eastern coast of North America and graphically details crimes, carnage, death, and destruction together with the establishment of a temple in the New Jerusalem. Because... The, because the copy Woodruff made in his journal was written in the first person, some later readers attributed the vision to Woodruff. And that's what I did the first time that I made a video about this. I thought it was Wilfred Woodruff. Um, when I made it this time, you know, I had received some comments that were like, no, it was actually John Taylor. Like those are comments I got the first time that I made the video. And so this time remembering that I like checked some other places and they're, and they're like, yep, it's, it's, you know, John Taylor. So, Okay. Several factors, however, su suggest Woodruff had not authored the vision, but had simply made a copy of a curious but anonymous document that had been circulating. His journal entry introducing the vision explained that he had the vision copied, but did not say he had experienced the vision himself. Although he made the journal copy in mid-1878, the vision itself was dated December 16th, 1877, and nowhere in the journal for December 1877 did Woodruff, a meticulous journal keeper, uh, record receiving such a vision. Moreover, even though Woodruff's journal copy of the vision began in the first person with the words, I went to bed at the usual hour, Woodruff left a large blank between the words I and went showing an intention to fill in the name of the vision's author when he learned it. Similarly, let's just look at that again. See, here's the big blank right here. Here's the eye, and then went to bed. So big big blank for, okay, when, whenever I find out uh, who wrote this, I'll fill that in later. Okay. Um, okay. Similarly, the, the church historian's office clerk, whom Woodruff had, had copied the vision. Okay. Similarly, the church historian's office clerk, whom Woodruff had copied the vision, added a filing notation uh, to the document that included a large blank after the words vision had by. So vision had by blank. Finally, the text of the purported vision claimed its recipient was reading the revelations in the French language uh, when the vision occurred and Woodruff did not know French. Before long, other copies of the vision were circulating, attributing, uh, attributed this time, however, to Joseph F. Smith, a nephew of uh, Joseph, Joseph Smith Jr. Joseph F. Smith would become the church's seventh president in 1901 and was second counselor in its first presidency on November 17, 1880, when he publicly disclaimed that the vision uh, in an open letter uh, published un under the title A Fraud in the church-owned Desert Evening News. Uh, for some time, he wrote, and actually at this point, we're going to go ahead and read, we're going to read what he said. Okay, so uh, with this one, I, we're actually looking at the Millennial Star. I couldn't quite find where this was in the Desert News, um, but I was able to find it in the, in the Millennial Star. So a fraud. Uh, and by the way, the links for these sources are in the description box below, as well as the link for my spreadsheets. Okay, we published the following card from President Joseph F. Smith, which has been appearing in the news, lest copies of the forgery therein mentioned should have found their way to this side of the water. 
because the millennial the millennial star was for saints in the british isles okay salt lake city november 17th 1880 editor deseret news for some time i've heard rumors of a document going the rounds particularly in the southern part of the territory purporting to be a vision by joseph f smith a copy of this document was today handed to me by a friend Having read it, I deemed it my duty to announce through the news that so far as this pretended vision has been connected with my name, it is a fraud. I never had such a vision, and I'm wholly wholly ignorant of its author, and my name has been used in connection with it entirely without my knowledge. By inserting the above in the news, you will correct any false impressions which may have arisen in the minds of the people concerning this matter and oblige your brother... uh, and oblige your brother in the gospel, Joseph F. Smith. Okay, back to uh, Turley's book. Uh, Meanwhile, another startling prophecy was attracting the attention of church members. In 1893, two Latter-day Saint periodicals ran articles by a member who quoted a remarkable statement purportedly published in in 1739 in uh, Basel, Basel, Switzerland, The statement mourned the loss of the old true gospel and the powers thereof and predicted that within a hundred years, God would speak again. Uh, He will restore the old church again. Uh, I see a little people led by a prophet and faithful elders. The statement had purportedly prophesied. They are persecuted, burnt out, and murdered, but in a valley that lives towards a great lake, they will grow up, make a beautiful land, have a temple of magnificent splendor, have all the old priesthood <clears throat> with apostles, prophets, teachers, and deacons. Because the statement precisely reflected aspects of Mormon history, <clears throat> excuse me, many saw it as a remarkable prophecy validating their belief in the church. Let's just pause right here. You guys, we can't just fall for things because it validates, you know, the church or the Book of Mormon or whatever. You have to be skeptical of where things come from because Guess what? People lie. People lie. Whether it's for attention, it could be for money, it could be for attention, it could uh, simply be they want to feel special, uh, it could be that they want to pull a trick on, on a group of people. There's different reasons why people do things, but we can't just go after every single thing and then just blindly accept it off of face value. And I feel like there's so many people that do that. It, it's unbelievable. Um, and it's been a it's been a problem throughout the history of the church, and uh, I think there's different reasons for that. But there's different types of people that will fall for certain things. There's different reasons. But anyway, <clears throat> because the statement pre- precisely reflected aspects of Mormon history, many saw it as a remarkable prophecy re- validating their belief in the church. In 1908, however. A general authority of the church published an article titled A Fraudulent Prophecy Exposed, in which he expressed skepticism about the statement's authenticity. For my part, he opined, I am free to admit that I regard it as a fake and a fraud. He had been to Basel and had found the book he felt was supposed to contain the statement. The prophecy was not in it. He discouraged readers from using the statement, adding that, there is enough of real prophecy without using any that is bogus. Um, we're going to skip down. Meanwhile, the bogus vision uh, document that Joseph F. Smith had hoped to unmask by his 1880 letter to the Deseret Evening News continued to mislead church members. Its circulation became so prominent as to merit inclusion in talks given at the church's October 1918 general conference by Joseph F. Smith himself, then church president and his son, Joseph Fielding Smith Jr., a member of the Quorum of the Twelve, who was then serving as an assistant church historian and would someday become president also. Uh, We are going to read directly from that. Okay, so this is October 1918 General Conference. Okay, this is conference report uh, in the church history catalog. President Joseph F. Smith, Spurious Revelation. Again, I feel that it is an opportunity for me to say a few words. This wonderful, mysterious revelation that I have been said to have received a great many years ago was given in French, and I never knew but two or three words in French in my life, 
Consequently, I could not have been the originator of that revelation. I want you to understand that. I have denied it, I suppose, a hundred times when I have been inquired of, inquired of about it. It has gotten up by some mysterious person who undertook to create a sensation and lay the responsibility upon me. I am not guilty. When the Lord reveals something to me, I will consider the matter with my brethren. And when it becomes proper, I will let it be known to the people and not otherwise. Okay. Then the next section is called how the black, red, and white horse revelation was started. The ridiculous story about the red horse and the black horse and the white horse and a lot of trash that has been circulated about and printed and sent around is a... Uh, sorry, I got to scroll up here. Is a great revelation given by the prophet Joseph Smith is a matter that has gotten up, I understand, some 10, ten years after the death of the prophet Joseph Smith by two of our brethren who put together some broken sentences from the prophet that they may have heard him utter from time to time and formulated this so-called revelation out of it. And it was never spoken by the prophet in the manner in which they have put it forth. It is simply false. Uh, that is all there is to it. And then we'll continue. And you guys, that's that's like that's another thing. Like this whole thing about the four horsemen of the apocalypse. You, you read in the book of Revelation about the four horsemen, but they correspond to the first four seals, uh, and each seal represents a thousand years. You go to the Institute Student Manual, the church interprets that to mean that the four horsemen they had to do with the first 4,000 years of Earth's history. And people still think that it has to do with the future, that we haven't seen the four horsemen yet. It's not true. And I feel like this was probably something that was along those lines. Anyway, continuing, <clears throat> how the string revelation was concocted. In 1858, I had the privilege of traveling through California with Charles Wesley Wandell, a former member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and at that time also a member of the church. He told me himself in the presence of witnesses that he wrote the document himself on which the organization of J.J. String was founded, and he was never so surprised as when he found out that J.J. String accepted his vagaries for a revelation from God, and he had only laughed at it and repented of it ever since. Uh, String is this guy right here. Uh, this is one of like the... He, he essentially started a splinter group uh, after the death of Joseph Smith. And it seems that it did well for a while, according to this. And then most of the members of his church uh, ended up joining the community of Christ. But there still is, uh, there, there, there's still like a, su a surviving element today. According to this, there's like 130 members of the church and six congregations. So it's just one of these uh, splinter groups. Okay, continuing. Okay, now this is really important. Please pay attention. How men may know the truth. Okay, so we're talking about mysterious revelations and things not coming through the proper channels, not coming through the prophet. Um, we're talking about splinter groups, like these little groups that form from time to time that want to break away from the church and bring people with them. How men may know the truth. Now, these stories of revelations that are being circulated around are of no consequence except for rumor and silly talk by persons that have no authority. The fact of the matter is simply here in this. No man can enter into God's rest in, unless he will absorb the truth insofar that all error, all falsehood, all misunderstandings and misstatements, uh, he will be able to sift th thoroughly and dissolve and know that it is error. Um, sorry, and not truth. When you know God's truth, when you're in, when you enter into God's rest, you will not be hunting after revelations from Tom, Dick, and Harry all over the world. And this is something that, again, I've seen it my entire life. People that are just, they're never satisfied with what we have. I've been doing this channel for three years, going into what we have, official uh, statements and documents and scriptures and general conference talks, things that we have that are authorized, and I can't even cover it all. 
and it's taken a lot of work. But there's people that just, they are never satisfied with what we have. They never try and perfect the basic principles of the gospel. Always searching for the esoteric, the hidden, the mysterious, the spectacular. Like, we can't do that. We can't do that. I know it may not be, it might not give you as much excitement to practice charity and love and faith or to look over what we have. You know, it may not be exciting because you feel like, oh, well, we've all already covered that. You know, what, what's the new thing? What's the new thing? You guys, one, one of the things that we need to, that we need to practice, it's a virtue. It's patience because the Lord will reveal new things, but it's going to come in an orderly way and it's going to come through the proper channels and it shouldn't be accepted until it does come through the proper channels. The gospel is not like a choose your own adventure where you just like, or no, sorry, not a choose your own adventure, but it, like I've said before, it's not like the, it's not like the Star Wars expanded universe where before Star Wars went to Disney, just anybody could write a book and then George Lucas would be like, yeah, that's okay. We'll add that to the canon. It's fine. The gospel's not like that where you can just like patch on your own, you know, stuff. It comes in an orderly or orderly way through the prophet and through the apostles. So I'm going to read this again because I like it. When you know God's truth, when you enter into God's rest, you will not be hunting after revelations from Tom, Dick, and Harry. So in other words, just random people that you've never heard of before all over the world. You will not be following the will of the wisps of the vagaries of men and women who advance nonsense and their own ideas. When you know the truth, you will abide in the truth, and the truth will make you free, and it is only the truth that will free you from the errors of men and from the falsehood and misrepresentations of the evil one who lays in wait to deceive and to mislead the people of God from the paths of righteousness and truth. God bless you. Amen. Uh, This is actually pretty timely coming across this. This is a really timely thing to come across. Uh, I I just, I was making this video, you know, we were going over the idea of the cleansing of America. I wanted to get to the bottom of this. And then I come across this and I came across this because of Jessica uh, Ship who sent it to me. Okay. And then the last one, this is from Joseph Fielding Smith in 1931. Okay. We need to start here uh, under a section called to avoid deception. April, 1931 general conference. We are living, as it has already been stated, in a day of trouble, of tribulation, when men's hearts are failing them. The Lord pointed out this day, while in his ministry, and admonished by prophecy those living now to watch and pray, that they might not be led astray, that they might not be found unprepared, should they be so, uh, should they be so fortunate as to be here at the great day of his coming. Much has been said by way of warning and for the guidance of this people by the previous speakers, so that we may be prepared to discern between truth and falsehood, and that we may detect those who speak falsely and do not love the truth. I would like to present another phase of this matter because I feel that it is timely. Several times, sorry, several times within the past three months, I've been approached by individuals and have received communications through the mails making inquiry concerning a certain purported revelation said to have been given many years ago to to President Joseph F. Smith, in which he saw the destruction of many great cities and many countries of the world and other very unusual things. Inquiry has also been made regarding a purported vision given to the Prophet Joseph Smith in relation to the same things in which has been in circulation for many years. It is evident that these things are again being circulated and many of the people are becoming agitated over them, wondering if they are true or not. And some of the people have been deceived, branded as false by President Joseph S. Smith. At the October conference of the church in the year 18, sorry, 1918, which was the last general conference attended by President Joseph F. Smith, I made some remarks in relation to these two so-called visions and pointed out the fact that they were not true. At the time of my remarks, President Smith arose and also spoke of them. Let me say that this communication 
that has come into my hands recently and about which I have been asked for advice was being circulated very extensively at that time. It is a purported revelation given to Joseph F. Smith many years ago. All right, and then he quotes what we already read, so I'm not going to read that again. And then after quoting that, he says, Now I think we are now I think we are fortunate in having President Smith's own expression in regard to these purported revelations. It seems strange to me that now, some twelve years later, yeah, in our case, I don't know how I don't know how many years later, I'm not gonna do the calculations, but here we are in 2024. We still find them in circulation. But the thing that astonishes me more is the is the fact that members of the church seem to be bewildered and in wonderment whether or not these purported revelations were indeed given to the prophet Joseph, Joseph and to President Joseph F. Smith. Okay, next page. In a revelation given to the church in May 1831, when matters of a similar kind were being circulated among the people, the Lord said, Hearken, O ye elders of my church, and give ear to the voice of the living God, and attend to the words of wisdom which shall be given unto you, according as ye have asked and are agreed as touching the church, and the spirits which have gone abroad in the earth. Behold, verily I say unto you, that there are many spirits which are false, which are false spirits, which have gone forth in the earth deceiving the world. And also Satan hath sought to deceive you, that he might overthrow you. Then the revelation goes on further to give instructions in regard to the the receiving of revelations and the duty of members of the church in regards to matters of this kind. Okay, the next section is called A Key for Our Guidance. I would like to say, for the benefit of the members of the church, that we have a key given us by revelation by which false spirits may be known, by which false revelation may be known. There is only one man in this church at a time, who has the right to receive revelation for the church. The Lord has said that his house is a house of order, not a house of confusion. And therefore, one is appointed to speak. One has the right to receive the the word of the Lord and give it to the church. We all have the right to receive revelation for our own guidance. A president of a stake has the right of revelation for the guidance of his stake, but no man has the right to receive revelation for this church except the one whom the Lord has called. If he receives a revelation, it will be declared without question if it is in or sorry, if it is intended for the church in a manner by which we may all know the source from from whence it comes. And when we find people secretly distributing what are said to be revelations or visions or manifestations that have not come have not come from nor received the approval of the authorities of the church, we may put it down that such things are not of God. We do not need to write to ask questions in regard to these things. We do not need to question question them for a moment because the Lord is not going to give a revelation to any high priest, any elder or 70 for this church. It will come through the one who is so appointed. And if the Lord is not going to choose those who have standing in the quorums of the priesthood, you may be certainly assured that he is not going to choose someone Uh, who does not hold the priesthood at all. So our minds may be at rest in regard to the matters of this kind. All right, to finish this up, let's go back to uh, Richard E. Turley's book. There's just a small part I want to read right here. After the conference, so I think this would have been the, um, the the October 1918 conference. After the conference, yet another copy of the document was sent to the church president's office to be added to those already in the church's collection. On a copy received earlier that year, the president had written along the margins, not a word of truth in it. Signed, Joseph F. Smith. So I I think that wraps it up. It's not a true vision, not a word of truth in it. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take it off my spreadsheet. I haven't done that yet, but I'm going to take it off here. But I want to be able to refer to this in the future. So I'm going to put it on my quotes A through Z spreadsheet, uh, probably under fake vision or false vision let me know what you think i should call it and then um whatever i think is best that's how i'll list it on my quotes a through z spreadsheet but i'm going to keep a copy of the vision itself that i transcribed it's right here um and then i'm going to include everything that we just read 
so that if this comes up again, I can refer back to it. If like somebody thinks that it's a real vision, I could be like, no, look at what Joseph F. Smith said, Joseph Fielding Smith. And, um, and hopefully put this to bed uh, in the year 2024. I don't know how long this is going to persist. It tricked me, you know, and that's fine. Like, again, we're not robots. We, we can't remember everything. We can't search every single database and read every single journal. And that's just how it is. But when you come across new information, you need to absorb it and you need to stick with the good information and, and throw out the bad. And, and it's okay. It's okay if you're wrong or if you were misled. Just You just change. You just go with the better information. And this is the better information. Um, there was one last thing that I thought I, I'm, that I'd like to read. Um, if you go down, go down just a little bit, this is just a little bonus content. Okay, it says here, in 1945, copies of a typed story began circulating among Latter-day Saints about a great white chief. Uh, whose people lived in a remote mountain region in southern Mexico and who were described in terms reminiscent of the Book of Mormon. The story asserted that the chief had become the leader of all Indian tribes and nations of the Western Hemisphere and was preparing them to build a great temple in the United States. The author of the story, a member of the church, attributed attributed his information to a Navajo uh, described as a tribal historian. The story was soon denounced by various church leaders. By 1953, however, copies of the story had continued to circulate so widely among church members that Spencer W. Kimball, a member of the Quorum of the Twelve who had become church president in 1973, found it necessary to publish an article about it. Quote, In spite of the fact that the people have been repeatedly warned by letter through their local church authorities and from pulpit and press, there are still some who persist in spreading the ficti- the fictional story of the coming of the great white chief, he wrote. Although he attributed the story's prominence to, quote-unquote, well-meaning people, and who had, quote-unquote, copied and distributed far and wide this fanciful story, he noted that the most evocative elements of the story had been, quote, thoroughly investigated and found to be misleading, and most elements totally untrue. End quote. And he concluded the article by he concluded the article by expressing hope that quote that further duplication and circulation of this fictional story will cease. End quote. Um, I'll continue a little bit more. Yet the story continued to circulate, and in 1966, the church issued another statement. This time to local church leaders. Quote, although this story has been repudiated, repudiated numerous times and found to be untrue in practically all of its major allegations, uninformed persons, okay, uninformed persons, and it's okay if you just don't know, but once you're informed, you need to act like you're informed. Uninformed persons continue to duplicate and distribute copies of this mythical composition. Uh, it is requested, therefore, that members be instructed to (laughs) refrain from duplicating and distributing copies of this fictional story. And then it seems to me that this book just goes on. Uh, It seems like it has more of these things that come up. It's something that's happened all throughout the history of the church. You guys don't fall for it. You know, there may be different stories, different flavors, different styles, different people, but it's the same thing. Please don't listen to false spirits. All right. That's going to be for this one. If you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe. Like this video if you liked it. Leave your thoughts and opinions down in the comments below. Also, make sure to share it, and I'll talk to you guys later.